Does Mormonism get in the way of learning about Jesus? Next on the Ex-Mormon Files. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you spending some time with us. Uh, today we have Karen Cross here, who's come to share her story, and we're going to meet her husband next time. But uh, Karen, I'm really happy to have you here. Thank you. And uh, I guess as we kind of do every time, where are you born and where are you from? Where did you grow up? Um, I'm uh, an Air Force brat, as they say, oh, yeah. so I was born in Okinawa. And oh, my, my parents are converts. Mm -hmm. My mother was raised by a Lutheran minister. And my yeah. dad had a little bit of, to do with Baptists, but I don't think he was real active. And so they weren't active. They, well, they, the missionaries knocked on their door in St. John's, Newfoundland, and before I was born. Uh -oh. And my mother had been on a plane in 1950 and had met, there was a singing competition. <laughs> and there were lots of college students. And there was one group of college students called Curtain Time USA, which later became very well known as the Young Ambassadors. Oh, from BYU. And all she heard was Mormon and BYU, but she was impressed with those students. Yeah. So years and years later, when the missionaries knocked on her door, yeah. And she, where was this at? Where in St. John's, Newfoundland. In, in New, mm -hmm. Newfoundland. Yeah, okay. in Newfoundland. And, uh, and uh, my parents joined the church, and that was back before they required you. My dad was a heavy smoker. Three packs a day. I don't even know really what that means, but yeah, he was. He said if he was awake, he was smoking. So they allowed him to be baptized with that, and my mother, really? um, they did, and um, my mother came down with Hodgkin's disease, and she, she died the summer of 1966. Just and, sure, yeah. yeah, they were married about 11 years. I was three, uh -huh. and um, my mother was given a blessing, um, and in that blessing, my father wasn't there. And she was really ill that last summer, and she knew she was dying. Mm -hmm. He didn't know she was dying. She knew she was dying. Mm -hmm. And she was given a blessing by the branch president in Okinawa that said, your husband will quit smoking today. And he did. Oh, and that sucked my dad tight. He, yeah. That was church, huh? priesthood, yes. <laughs> and then she died in August. And then a couple months later, we were still in Okinawa, and a plane crashed coming back from Vietnam. Mm. And he was asked to um, help clean up the bodies that were in the river. And he recognized them. He was a pilot. They were pilots. He knew the pilots. Mm. And he was getting really angry that they could see his wife, and he was stuck here. Anyway, the branch president um, said, have you ever heard about eternal marriage? <laughs> and that was the hook, line, and sinker, and my dad was all in at that point. He wanted my mother, and, and so we were raised true believing Mormons, and we actually moved to Utah when he retired. I was almost five. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up within sight of BYU. My mother's dying wish was to raise us at BYU, and he didn't mm -hmm. know where that was. <laughs> well, he found out where that was, and so I grew so up in Provo. So you grew up in Utah? County. Yeah, so we moved here, and it's interesting. I've lived here most of my life, and I felt like an outsider. The the people in my neighbor we were outsiders, and uh, because of because we weren't from Utah, oh, and yeah. so really felt that. oh boy, did I feel that, and and I didn't have a mother, you know, I didn't oh. we didn't fit the family. My dad was well respected, which made it easiest easier for us kids. I mean, in the Mormon Church, if your parents are respected, the kids are treated better, yeah. you know, yeah. and in that case, that was for me. My dad actually, <laughs> my dad was so cute. Um, he would. They would give him Mother's Day flowers on Mother on Mother's Day. Oh, did they? Yeah, and he accepted it. And he he taught that and back in that time. You remember this, the sixties and seventies, and he'd get ribbed and in priesthood <laughs> um, for wearing an apron and all this stuff. And he'd say, you know, if a man won't do what's deemed women's work and neglect his family, well, then he isn't much of a man. And he would say that, you know, like in sacrament meeting, you know. Yeah. So my dad was my dad is um, was. Um, probably the greatest person I've ever met. Really a sweetie, huh? Yeah. yeah. Raised you. So I grew up totally, I mean, we went to everything. Okay. <laughs> and we were early. Remember, he's <laughs> military. Yeah. So so not only did we go to everything, we were there early. And, and you know, as you grow up, you know, you have, you have this, and they, they teach you, well, if you don't have a testimony, rely on somebody else's. 
And so I did. I, I believed my dad. My dad believed this. I trusted my dad. And so I relied on his testimony. And you know, and they say you can believe in prayer and you can have a belief in this. And so I had my little, little testimonies. But, you know, as far as the whole church was concerned, I, I, you know, you're a teenager, you know, and, and so by the time I was old enough and I met somebody and I was going to get married and I had had a, a boyfriend in high school that wasn't Mormon, that I remember the day I had to let him go because I wasn't going to disappoint my dad. I had to marry. You went to high school together? We did. And I was going to marry the return missionary in the temple. Oh. And so I did. And I remember where I was when I let um, my true love go. <laughs> and, uh, and I was all in. I was, you know, once I made the decision and uh, I was, I, I knew that the church was going to be important to me. And so I made this decision and, and I meant it. And so for me, uh, things began to change. I'm slow in the pickup, Earl. <laughs> but March 21st, 1983 was when I received my endowment. And that was the beginning of me leaving the church. The temple, um, the word cult actually went through my head. And I was going through, um, and it was 1983, so there were penalties involved. And, oh, yeah, and, that was before uh, 1990. Yeah. So of course. And, uh, I felt like property. That was when I obeyed the law of my husband. The veiling of my face was caused me great concern. I, I almost ran out. But during the ceremony, one of the things that absolutely distressed me the most was I looked around at, at the people in the room, and it looked normal to them. I've actually found that even more distressing. <laughs> but in the... And your dad the, was there, of that's, course. I and... saw my dad. Yeah. And I looked at him, and I said, he believes this. And that was enough for me at that time. And I never have liked the temple. I was not a frequent goer. Um, I thought things would get better with the temple when 1990. Oh, that's it. I just didn't like the penalties, you know. And then, no. And then it was, oh, it was this. And then it was this. There was always something that I, that I thought was wrong with me. You know, you'd hear these people in sacrament meeting, and they would go on and on and on about the temple. And I'm like... Well, I am. Something's wrong with me because did, did I'm just not to getting it. Did you your husband about it or your um, dad? Even? Well, the man I was married to really struggled with the church uh, th through our whole marriage. You know, even and, as a return missionary. Though. Yeah, and as a, as a return missionary, and so that was in 1983, and then two and a half years later, in 1985, uh, polygamy hit me straight in the face. And you know, because you know, when you're younger, how did that happen? What was it? That... Um, it was discussed as. This is celestial marriage. You, you know, this is back in the day. You know, you remember we had just, I mean, Bruce Armour Conkey was still alive. You know, we had gone through the, you know, Joseph Fielding Smith years and the Marky Peterson years. And, you know, they didn't pull punches. I mean, they were doctrine is doctrine, and that's the way it is. And, yeah. and I mean, the kids today don't even know this doctrine. You know, it's changed so much. It does seem and different. Now, it is different. Yeah. And, and so it was discussed in Sunday school. It just, it blew my mind. I mean, I had heard about polygamy and it kind of hovered out here, but, you know, and in, 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 in seminary, it was, oh, girls prepare for it. And it was all this talk. It's going to come back at the millennium. And, and, um, and I can unequivocally say that the doctrine of polygamy has caused me more harm as a woman, as a wife, as a friend, as a mother, than any other experience I've had. And I've had some pretty tough experiences. I feel like it, it hampered my growth. Did it? Yeah. And I actually wouldn't be friends with people. Like, if they were okay with it, it's like, you are not my friend. Like, my sister-in-law. If they, were, if I, they oh, yeah. were in favor, or yeah. not in favor, or but under, even accepting. accepted it. It's like, yeah. oh, well, one day, what are we told? You know, one day we'll understand. You know, <laughs> no, no, one day I am not going to understand. And to the point where it, it left me terrified of the Bible. Because what did they say? It's commanded in the Bible. And and that's too bad. So you felt like it, yeah, it was I, going to confirm that yes, polygamy was and, it. And, and I was at the, I, I believe so strongly about this that I would have become atheist if I had really believed God commanded that. And so I struggled with that. And then it just seems about every two and a half years, something else came up. So the temple was out, you know, I don't really believe the temple. That just can't be right. Well, what, you know? what was it about the temple? Anything specific? That, or was it well, just the Well, they talk about there? this triangle. You know, you've got God when you get married. Yeah. And you've got the husband, you have the wife, and there's this triangle involved. That is not the temple. The temple was like, 
it was uh, God, answer. my husband, and then me. Yeah. You know, that I had to go through my husband, and uh, and you know, and then you you were taught that you will lay in the grave until your husband receives the keys of resurrection. He will resurrect you. And I looked up the veil stuff. There is not one thing about a veil that it's always it's to hide, it's to keep secret, it's to shroud. Yeah. You know, and it was this the I I actually I would veil my face. But when they would say, you know, even when they got to the hearken part, um, you know what's funny, Earl? I have a current temple organ in my pocket right now. You do? It expires today. And uh, I have not been for two years. And, and people are saying, oh, don't you want to go see the new changes? No. Um, and uh, um, it, it was, I felt like property. You did? I did. I, I felt like, you know, that I always had to have my husband, there was always my husband between me and God. That yeah. I didn't have this direct line to God, and I just, I felt devalued. And he would be in expected there. to marry oh, yeah. other women. And people say, oh, well, we wear the same clothes. No, we do not. Uh, we wear veils, you know, and, uh, oh, we have the priesthood on this. And, uh, yeah. <sighs> Never liked the temple. And, uh, and, and I would go, you know, like, I think the most I ever went in a year was 12 times. And that was because I was committed. But I would go... Oh, maybe once or twice a year at the very most. Sometimes they'd go years in between. It just, I would feel icky there, yeah. you know. Did you ever really feel like you gained a testimony of the Book of Mormon, Joseph? I did of the Book of Mormon, and that, and that polygamy helped me do that. Okay, so 1985, the polygamy thing happens, and I'm praying and praying and praying, and the impression I got was stay in the Book of Mormon. Really? It's not in there. <laughs> Matter of fact, a lot of Mormon teachings aren't in there. <laughs> right. As the more the the Book of Mormon is infinitely closer to the Bible than Mormonism is to the Book of Mormon, <laughs> and and so I true. did, and I did gain you know a testimony of of just I don't know. I mean, there mm -hmm. are certainly some problems with the Book of Mormon with racism and certainly lots of problems. I mean, certainly anachronisms yeah. and all that. But I did gain a, a belief that in God. And so, two and a half years later, in 1988, um, we were having a discussion in Sunday school about the sireship of Jesus Christ, which sent me into another tailspin of doctrine. <laughs> and uh, explain that just a little okay, bit. Okay. So, when I was a little girl, I mean, I remember hearing it. They had this teaching that, you know, you, they had a picture of your dad, and they had a picture of your mom. This was in a family home It was in a family home evening manual. And I remember it because the the child in it was a little girl. It's like, oh, little girl, representation. Yeah. Ah. And, uh, and and then they have um, God and Mary, and then it points down and it says Jesus, you know. Yeah. So we were discussing the sireship of, you know, and they didn't come out, and, you know, I were since found out this. No, was I, was, I was in the class. You were in the class. And okay. the teacher alluded to this. And somebody else kind of picked up on it, and I was like, "Our wait, hold up here. I just want to make sure I got this right. Um, are you saying that God and Mary had sex? You know, had intimate relations?" And uh, and one guy speaks up, "Well, it is none of our business." And I was like. It is our business. If you want me to worship this God, it was my business. So I actually went on um, um, a research. And, boy, I found a lot of prophets. That, yeah, and they say it. I mean, Melvin J. Ballard's actually, I mean, his is probably the boldest. Um, no, no, no. It just is how you would sire your children is how God sired Jesus. Yeah. And I know not, Bruce R. McConkey said oh, it yes, a couple of times. Yes, yes. There's like eight of them there that were pretty bold statements. And in 1994, I was taking care of my dad because um, my sister and my brother and I, we shared my dad the last few years of his life. Oh, okay. And so he lived in my home. He lived in my sister's home. He lived in my brother's home. It was a really good experience. And I was at my sister's house, and this impression revelation thing came into my head and it was that Jesus was God in Mary's womb that this wasn't this production thing and I actually mentioned it to my dad at the time and I said dad I just got a message from God about Jesus and he goes does it and I said and it doesn't match any doctrine that we have and you know what he said to me you just keep it in your heart and don't share with anybody but you keep it and which wow. tells me now that maybe he had his own maybe things he, he was, was keeping. Yeah. yeah. And so I never shared that with anybody. Mm. And then the next big, and that would be like 1994. Yeah. And then um, 2003 rolls around, 
and my life exploded into confetti. And I found out the man I was married to had been unfaithful for most of our marriage. And at the time, I was willing to work through it. But what it brought up was the polygamy thing again. Only one thing could have made that worse, is if that had been commanded by God, oh. and this was legal <laughs> adultery, you know. Yeah. And so that stirred that up again. But what it really brought up was, and that was when I learned the priesthood wasn't real. Um, the things these priesthood leaders said to me, and uh, during his during, during well, we went through. You talked to he he wanted to go through the repentance process, okay. and that was excruciating on us all. Yeah, and one thing too was we were said you know because he blessed babies and he baptized and he ordained and he was um, my son was on a mission. I had this just whole time. yes, yeah. and um, and and they would say, oh, don't worry, those all hold. It's like. Well, the scripture says, amen to the power of that man, you know, and yeah. so it can't be both. Oh, no, no, God would never punish the children. It's like, well, he's punishing the kids down the road whose dad doesn't hold the priest. You know, it just, the cognitive dis dissonance yeah. was. And just my treatment, it became very apparent that the goal was to get him back in the church. He was excommunicated, and the goal, at my expense, I mean, truth no longer was important. Yeah. And uh, and then they kept calling him to get this, and it came time he was rebaptized, and it came time to receive his blessings back, and uh, and I didn't want any part of it, and so I wouldn't write a letter, and I was sufficiently punished for that. I I learned that if you don't do what your priesthood leaders say, <laughs> they will punish you somehow. Yes, and uh, um, if you if they aren't your authority, and I actually had a really cool experience. I was. He was not willing to change, and, and I had to make a decision. And I was driving up by, actually by the Provo Temple, believe it or not, right by the MTC, <laughs> and words went across my dashboard. It shocked me so much that I didn't read it. <laughs> so words went across again, and I can only assume they are the same words. And the words were, the church threw him out. And it was like, you're right. They threw him out, but they are expecting me to do something completely different. They wanted me to, to them, I could only be forgiving if I just swept it under the rug mm -hmm. and got him back in, you know, and I wasn't willing to do that. And I was willing, I, I wanted to um, feel value, you know, sure. so I did. I stepped off the cliff and I um, divorced him and I didn't have anything. I didn't have any schooling. It worked out that I was able to keep my house, and I went to school. And what's interesting, Earl, was as soon as I quit listening to my priesthood leaders, <laughs> my life just took off like a rocket. Really? As soon as I started listening to God and doing what God told me to do, I just shot out like a rocket. And I haven't, I haven't topped out. I'm still going. <laughs> it's been absolutely fabulous since then. Well, have I guess kind of going back to you, what was your relationship with Jesus, or what did you think of I him? I felt like he was drawing me to you, him. When you were okay, so, younger. Oh, younger, I think I was a typical Mormon. I don't think Jesus was that big of a deal, you know? I mean, he, Mormons don't know until they actually, like I didn't know until I became Christian and started attending Christian stuff, how little we actually talk about Jesus, really. Oh, we throw we his don't name notice out it, no. do we? I, no, I don't we think don't. I noticed it. I mean, that's been my biggest thing is being a Christian. It's like, holy cow. I mean, I, I thought we talked about Jesus. I thought, no, no. Well, that's what I started out with. Does Mormonism get in the way of learning yes. about Jesus? It, it, uh, families are yes. forever in the yes. way. Priesthood's in the way. Absolutely the in the way. Uh, it, it, he's not our highest authority. Priesthood authority is. Yeah. And, and so for me was in 2015, I had this goal of reading the Bible. I'd never read the Bible. I'm going to do it. So I started reading the Bible, and for two years I stayed in LDS.org. And while I was in there, I looked around <laughs> and read the Joseph Smith's papers and started coming up on things because I already the doctrine was already a sticking point. I just I just don't believe the doctrine. It just you know, and I stayed in LDS.org until I came on Holda. And in Second Kings, it talks about King Josiah. It's like you know we got to know what God's talking about. So he sends the high priest. He sends his priest. You know, go find out what God wants us to do. So he sends them to the prophetess, Holda. I thought, oh, let's see what the church says about that. So, of course, I'm back on LDS.org, and it said, Holda has the gift of prophecy. 
like every member of the church can have. It's like, poof. So what I did with that, Discounted after, her yeah, completely. Let's, let's just <laughs> hold up. Um, I decided to look at the Bible scholars. And this is the same month that I also, I was teaching gospel principles. I was looking up a talk that Jeffrey Holland had given that summer called The Greatest Missionary Story Ever Told. Yeah. And all I could find was a recantation. So Jeffrey Holland was very helpful in my exit um, because <laughs> what I learned was I believed that missionary story when I read it. Oh, well, sure. And um, to find out that that was a complete lie told me that, Karen, you can believe a lie and think it's the truth. See, and those little things just penetrate up. the heart, don't they? That opened and up. your mind? Yeah, that opened up the world for me. And when I opened up um, this recantation, uh, Radio Free Mormon, I don't know if you've heard of him, he was also in, because you know, you know how they have a list of, you check this out, check this out, and, and that kind of opened up my world. And so I decided in 2018, my spiritual goal was I wanted to learn what the grace of God really was. What is this grace that they're talking about? Well, in, but you hadn't really understood that no, as a because Mormon. As a Mormon, it's his grace is sufficient after all you can do. Yeah. You know, after you would deny yourself of all ungodliness, <laughs> like that's possible. So who threw yeah. grace out there to make you Me. question? Oh, I read the Bible. I was oh, reading the Bible. Of course. <laughs> and, and it was different than the Book Funny of Mormon. <laughs> yeah. And so 2018, and then I decided, okay, I already don't believe in the priesthood now. I don't believe in the temple. I don't believe in polygamy, for sure. So I don't really believe all these things. So what am I doing? You know, and so I decided, I said, okay, let's look into the history. And then it was uh -huh. crumbled quick. Yeah. And uh, in May of 2018, I started looking around. This is just a few months ago. Yeah, right? it's not been very long. Yeah. I'm fresh out. And uh, um, I was looking at podcasts. And in Lehigh, they had this Fellowship Bible Church. And I was, this Pastor Chad was giving these, these lessons. I mean, oh my goodness. I was like, I mean, I felt like I could see in color for the first time. I felt like my ears were open for, I mean, what they talk about, you know. And I just plucked my courage up one day and drove down there and attended the class. Fell in love with it. It was this And I've been Sunday? going since. Or? It was. It was on a Sunday morning. So I would go to that, and then my church was at 1. Then I'd go teach my lesson at 1. And what they don't know is since October, I had been using Bible scholars. I wasn't using LDS material yeah. anymore and we actually like oh my gosh these lessons are so awesome it's like yeah because we're getting it from people who know what they're talking about because you were teaching gospel principles i was i was but you were using bible using... scholars and pastor chad and so when he and actually the people listening liked it they loved it yeah oh i would get texts and say where are you learning all this stuff you know and uh <laughs> and then there was a bad experience because i ended up I'm, I'm remarried and there was a bad experience and he's a convert um, with a mission, a primary present from another ward, and I, I knew it would happen one day, and he was hurt badly, and mm. he didn't want to come anymore. And then a lady at church um, was really awful to me, and my husband heard about it, and he just said, "Karen, we already don't believe this." He says, "I just don't want you to go anymore. He says, please don't go anymore." And by then, I mean I was already looking up. Um, Sean McCraney, I was into Bill Real. I, I had, I'm not a huge Mormon Stories fan, but I looked at a couple things. Mm -hmm. um, I watched you and... Um, and listened to those stories. We haven't had too many comment on that. Did you hear some stories that kind of... Yes, well, because what happened to me is, as a Mormon, this term, born again, is kind of hokey pokey <laughs> sounding, you <laughs> as know. As a Mormon. As a Mormon, it is, yeah. you know what had happened to me. And that whole Ezekiel 36 where, you know, the Lord says he'll take your heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. And I remember what at that moment. What, 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 what was that moment? That moment, I, I don't know what brought it on. I just remember um, that I felt like Jesus had me in his hand, you know? And it was like, he had said to me, he came to me when, when my life had exploded. And, oh, I call it my my darkest hour. I'm a Star Wars fan, so help me, help me, help me, help me, help me <laughs> our darkest hour. And I remember feeling Jesus saying, take my hand. And I remember saying to him, I can't see your hand. And he said, look around you. It's everywhere. You know, and, and it was more so than that. And so I cried myself to sleep that night because I knew if I died that night, I knew where I'd be when I woke up. Mm -hmm. And I have never felt that as a Mormon. 
I was never good enough as a Mormon. It was always, have I done enough yeah. as a Mormon? You know, do you think I've checked enough boxes? <laughs> you know, and uh, and I just remember that moment that I then born again. You know, if I die, I know where I'll be. And you know, I don't know what that looks like yet. Yeah. And it doesn't matter. But I just know it's going to be and, wonderful. And it's joyful, isn't yes. it, to, to be learning. Yeah, and, and the world's changed for me, Earl. Yeah. I no longer live in fear. I no longer, I, I hadn't even realized how much of my life, I grew up during, the, you got to have food storage, the end of the world's coming, oh, polygamy's yeah. coming. I mean, I think about how many decisions I have made in my life based in fear. Based on the church. Based on, you know, I didn't get a career. I stayed home. I mean, I'm a, I'm a good mother. You know, I ask, I, I think, you know, but that is not, I would not have chosen this life. How many kids did you have? I have five. Great. I know. I say, no one should have more than three. And my kids are like, Mom. I said, well, which one should you give away? <laughs> well, it depends on what we're doing. And uh, um, um, I would have made completely, you know, truth matters sure. to me. I made decisions. I made decisions in my life. And I even think about the little kids. I didn't let my little kids play with because, you know, I, I just... Not play All these on dis- Sunday oh, or gosh. because they weren't members. Yeah, I, I've had some regret, and I, I was really angry at my dad at first. You know, Dad, you got me into this cult, you know, and I relied on you so much. And Greg, my new husband, said he did this for eternal marriage. And so cut him some slack, and it's like, you know, I, I have gotten over it. I was angry. I mean, I was angry, like could punch him in the face angry there for a while. <laughs> and, but I have thought about it. My dad was honorable. And my dad has integrity, and he was truthful. He was. And if he had the information that I have, I truly believe that he would have, he would have left, because yeah. truth matters. And so I feel like I have too much integrity to be a Mormon. You know, it's like <laughs> that sounds crazy to Mormons, but they have. Well, it you is, know. and and then that whole thing about being in Jesus's hands, oh, you know, yeah. to, to to know that. Yeah. That he loves you yeah. and that uh, yeah. who he is is just so special. And how I love people is is bigger. And I mean, I was in the Empire State Building in December of 2017, and I'm looking around at this world. And that was for the first time it hit me, you know, the Mormon God is puny. And <laughs> I believe in a, in a bigger God and a more wonderful God and who's, I just can't even explain it. Um, I want to help women like me that felt stuck, felt the doctrine was wrong, and they don't know anything else. And know, you know? that there's some hope at the end, that there's yeah. Jesus it's there a, at the end. It's a beautiful to, hope. Well, I know? love what you said about everything being now in color. Yes, you that's know? really how it seems. Yeah, it just, and, and my fear factor is gone, yeah. and it's been replaced with love. And it's, it's hard to explain, but it's like the world is bigger and brighter and more beautiful and less fearful than ever. Well, Karen, it's just been delightful to have you share some of your story, and we're going to actually meet or see Karen again when we talk to you and your husband. My and beautiful husband, <laughs> yes. And kind of hear their combined story. We do have a good cool so, story. So we appreciate you watching, and we'll catch you next time on the Ex-Mortal Files.